Amen. What a wonderful evening to be together, and thank you all for coming and joining us. We're so grateful for your presence here, and uh, we're grateful for God's presence. Want to uh, uh, just be sure to uh, wish everybody a Merry Christmas. I'm older than Pastor Jack, so if he can forget things, I can sure forget them. Hope you have a wonderful uh, evening and a wonderful day tomorrow with your family. Uh, this week, if you're visiting, I hope that uh, Christmas is very, very special to you. It's this time of year that we pray for people that um, maybe there's been a loss in your family this year. Uh, maybe someone's gone on to heaven. Maybe there's been a situation that was very difficult to deal with. And sometimes Christmas, although it's wonderful and beautiful and joyous, um, Christmas kind of accentuates sometimes loneliness or heartache or hurt. And we just want you to know that we're praying for you and your family uh, at this time of the year. Um, Pastor Jack said he was learning Christmas words, and I, I know about him. He can make up words on the fly. I've watched him do it in service. It's verses, choruses, songs. There was one little boy from this church years ago in Sunday school. There's an old song we used to sing, The Angels Beckon Me from Heaven's Open Door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. That little guy used to belt out at the top of his lungs, The Angels Peck at Me from Heaven's Open Door. Kind of unusual. I do have something I want to share with you tonight, and I'll uh, watch the time. We uh, don't want to take advantage of your time. We want to get you on your way to be with family. But last year, as we gathered together on Christmas Eve 2015, I shared uh, with the congregation gathered, and probably many of you were here, uh, a poignant Christmas advertisement. And it actually came from Germany. It was from the German grocery store, Edeka. And it was a, a really heartwarming reminder to their customers of this German grocery store about the importance of home and family at Christmas time. And because I thought they did such an incredible job last year, this year, I actually went online and went looking for their ad. And sure enough, it was a, a really uh, incredible advertisement. And uh, so we just subtitled it for you. Uh, if you speak German, you'll get it first time through. If not, you can read the subtitles. But once again, uh, this ad from this uh, wonderful business in Germany just reminds us all to consider how we spend our time at Christmas and uh, every other day of the year as well. So take a listen. Muss noch dies, muss noch das, muss noch jenes und irgendwas, muss noch hier, muss noch da und muss noch viel, viel mehr. Nach dem Tannenbaum umschauen. Ich muss noch einkaufen und alles hübsch verstauen. Ich muss die Dinge, wie sie müssen, überschauen. Und muss auf jeden Fall noch die Winterreifen draufhauen. Ich muss die aller, aller coolsten Plätzchen backen. Ich muss noch auf dem Weihnachtsmarkt versacken. Ich habe so viele Termine im Nacken. Und muss noch Deko aufs Hausdach packen. Muss nicht dies, muss nicht das, muss nicht jenes und nicht irgendwas. Ich muss nur eines, wie ich finde, für dich da sein, mein. best gift is time spent with you. Hashtag time. I thought that was incredible. And I do hope you take time to enjoy precious moments with your loved ones this Christmas, whether they're close at hand or whether they're far from home. And I thank you again for taking time out of your Christmas Eve celebrations just to join us here at CCC. 
It's a special honor tonight to greet our missionaries who will be joining us online, either live or a little later. And uh, we want you to know that all of you are such a vital part of CCC. This congregation is quite literally the church that missions built. And even though we're only together online with our missionaries, um, you're in our thoughts and prayers on this Christmas Eve. And uh, as the commercial just told us, the best gift is time spent with you. We love you. While time is very important to us for a number of reasons, in Scripture, time is not the main issue. Rather, eternity in Scripture is God's focus because God lives in eternity. And an eternity spent with him is God's goal, his ultimate goal for every one of us because nothing else really matters. And so God gives time to us mortals only because we really need that time to prepare ourselves for eternity. Always remember that your relationship with God on this day will affect your relationship with God on that day, the final day. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Today is the only time you have for sure. And so the Bible over and over again exhorts us to spend our time and spend our todays wisely. A guy named Harvey McKay wrote these words, Time is free, but it's priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. But once you've lost it, you can never get it back. Now, the miracle of the incarnation that we celebrate every December is that the God of eternity took on flesh and the God of eternity entered time. That's the incarnation. He was called in scripture, Emmanuel, which means literally God with us. And Jesus' life was bracketed, it was marked, it was bookended by two impossibilities. He came to earth through a virgin's womb and he left earth through an empty tomb, both impossible. He came to earth through a door marked no entrance and he left through a door marked no exit. The best gift God could have ever given us is this time that he spent on earth because for the 33 and a half years Jesus lived on this planet, he came to us to show us the way to get from time to eternity. In looking over a lot of these thoughts this week, uh, this old song, and a lot of the songs that I know are old, I can't remember why that is, um, but this old song just kept coming back to me, and the verses are very beautiful. In fact, Beverly and I used to sing this years, years and years ago, I think. Um, the verse says, the gulf that separated me from Christ my Lord, it was so vast, the crossing I could never ford. From where I was to his demands, it seemed so far, I cried, dear Lord, I cannot come to where you are. The second verse says, he came to me when I was bound in chains of sin. He came to me when I possessed no hope within. He picked me up and drew me gently to his side, where today in his sweet love I now abide. I can't tell you how many times that's gone over in my mind this week. Uh, partly probably because of the Christmas season and thinking about how God came to us. But the other reason it's gone over and over in my mind and in my heart is because I know so many people here in our church family, so many people that we're connected to, that that second verse really tells their story. That Jesus intersected their life when um, they may have looked good on the outside, but they didn't have a whole lot of hope on the inside. And the chorus simply says over and over, he came to me. And uh, I'd like you to try that with me, if you would, tonight in worship to the Lord. He came to me. He came to me. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. That's why he died on Calvary. 
When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. In Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes these words. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. He came to me. Would you sing that with me? He came to me. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. So simple. That's why he died. On Calvary. When I could not come to where he was he came to me when I could not come to where he was he came to me would you just sing it one more time with me why don't you lift a hand in the presence of the Lord he came to me Thank you, Jesus. He came to me when I could not come to where he was. He came to me. And that's why he died on Calvary for when I could not come to where he was he came to me oh when I could not come to where he was he came to me those are beautiful beautiful lyrics and I love the fact that God did that for us at Christmas time because it was the God of eternity who was entering time on that very first Christmas night for the very first time God who didn't need us but he loved us he would enter our realm he would enter time coming from eternity. And on that first Christmas night, here's what's so amazing. The prophets, they pinpointed that Jesus would arrive. In fact, in their little realm of time, so inferior to God's great realm of eternity, every once in a while, eternity would touch down and a prophet would speak hundreds of years, centuries before Jesus came. And they would speak the words of eternity and with pinpoint accuracy, they would announce his appearing. Moses spoke and he said, God's going to raise up a prophet like unto me. Jeremiah said, he'll be of the lineage of David. And Micah said, 
He'll be born in the tiny town of Bethlehem. Malachi said, the Messiah is going to come while the temple's still standing. And Asaph said, when he gets here, he's going to speak in parables. Isaiah said, he's going to be born of a virgin. He'll perform many miracles. He will not even open his mouth to defend himself. He'll be beaten and spit upon. He will die with criminals. And then he won't even have his own tomb. But the Messiah will be buried in a rich man's tomb. He'll really be buried among the wicked. The prophets spoke with pinpoint accuracy every once in a while. It's like they could reach up and they could get a hold of a little bit of eternity and they could pull it down into time. Zechariah, he spoke and said he's going to enter Jerusalem on a donkey. He said he'll be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver and he'll be pierced. David, the great psalmist, said his enemies someday are going to cast lots for his garments. He'll be given vinegar and gall to drink. His bones will not be broken. David even prophesied and said, He'll say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But David said, After that's all over, his body will not even see the corruption of death because he's going to conquer sin and he's going to ascend into heaven. And David said, Ultimately, he's going to defeat every enemy and make them like a footstool. And he will be called the Son of God. The prophets spoke it. And when they spoke it, it was like little laser beams went off into the future. And all of the prophets from the Old Testament, all of the prophets from centuries before, it was like for just an instance, they could reach up and they could get a hold of God's realm of eternity. And in their little realm of time, they could speak a word that went far beyond their lifetime. And we consider all these powerful, precise, messianic prophecies. Each one given by God to his prophets. Each one is unique. And each one contains a different little piece of the mystery. Each prophecy paints a portrait of the Messiah of Jesus Christ. And each of those prophecies, they existed for centuries of time. It was like they were just waiting for that moment of fulfillment. They were just waiting, all those prophecies, for the God of eternity to enter the realm of time where sinful mortals like you and I lived. You see, above all, what we call Christmas, Christmas is not just singing. Singing's wonderful. Christmas is not just sermons. That's okay. Christmas is the fulfillment of prophecy. When God literally entered time. Now, many of these prophecies, they're mentioned again in the New Testament. It looks backward after it's happened. And when they're mentioned in the New Testament, they're accompanied by a particular uh, Greek word that is used. And this particular Greek word in the New Testament speaks of their fulfillment. The word is plerao, or sometimes written pleroma. It's a Greek word. It's a, it's a word picture, and, and it pictures the filling up of something that was empty. Like you would take a cup, and you would pour into it, and you would fill that cup. And so prophecy comes and begins to converge through all the ages and we start to see this word in the New Testament and as all the pieces come together, Paul writes these words in Galatians chapter 4, but when the fullness of the time was come. Everybody say fullness. See, that's that word, play Roma. And that, that's that word. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we, all of us, might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, now God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. Folks, it's recorded over and over and over and over again in the New Testament with this word, plerao. It's, it's this Greek word, over and over it's used. And it, it's, it's always used in this sense that an event took place, that this happened or that happened, that this was spoken, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. Every time you see that word fulfilled, almost always it's this word. And, and so you could say that it was like these prophecies were waiting, like an empty cup just waiting to be filled up by the fulfillment of those prophecies. 
Literally, when the Bible says this, that it, uh, this was spoken or this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. Literally, what the Bible's saying is, this happened so that which was spoken by the prophets might be plurao, it might be filled, it might be like a cup, something that was empty being filled up. It's an amazing thing. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew is, is really quite remarkable. And Matthew begins to talk and write and he tells us many things about Jesus and we just read them as part of the Christmas story, but uh, there, there are things like this. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, there's that word again, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. Matthew uses this word a lot. When Joseph arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt, and that seems like just such an incidental thing to the nativity story. But the Bible says, and Joseph and Mary and young Jesus, they were there in Egypt until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled that the prophecy might be filled up like an empty cup, that which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. Uh, it was all orchestrated and arranged by prophecy that Jesus would live for a while in Egypt. The Bible tells us about that horrible time when King Herod, the ruthless king, killed all the babies trying to stamp out Jesus. And the Bible says, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying, in Ramah there was a voice heard. It's over and over and over that this word is used. The Bible tells us that Jesus came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth for a precise reason, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. The prophets had spoken it, so it had to happen. The prophets had spoken it, so it was just there waiting to be filled, waiting to be filled up. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 4 that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying the land of Zabulon and Nephtali and by the way of the sea beyond Jordan. Galilee of the Gentiles. See, this is where Jesus ministered. And here's what the prophet Isaiah spoke about that region of Israel. The people which sat in darkness saw great light and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. See, it was all part of God's amazing plan. In Matthew 8, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Everything in scripture, nothing's accidental, nothing's incidental. It all happens for a reason. In Matthew chapter 12, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. The Bible says about Jesus in this verse, it's amazing. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. That's the God we serve. That's the one we celebrate at Christmas time. He never turns anybody away. He never snaps anybody's heart in half. He always is kind and merciful and loving. Matthew 13, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. Why did Jesus teach in parables? Here, here's why. The Bible says, without a parable, he never spoke to the people, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. Even the teaching style of Jesus had been prophesied by the prophets of the Old Testament. It's amazing. It, it goes all the way through Matthew's gospel, chapter 21. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion... Thy king cometh to thee meek and sitting upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, what we call the triumphal entry, the prophets had, had portrayed that precisely, pinpoint accuracy. It was just a cup, an empty cup waiting to be filled up. It was written that it might be fulfilled. It was, it was, it was prophesied so someday the cup of prophecy could be filled up. Matthew chapter 26, Jesus he says to the people in the garden, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father? And he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. Jesus said, I don't have to be arrested tonight. I've got all power in heaven and earth at my disposal. I can turn around and walk out of the garden of Gethsemane and you can't touch me and you can't hurt me. But then Jesus said, But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled 
that thus it must be. Jesus said, I could do this. I could exercise freedom and I could use the power that I have at my disposal to get rid of all of this trial and all of this uh, opposition, but I can't do that because if I did that, it would break prophecy. If I did that, the cup wouldn't be filled up. Matthew chapter 26, in that same hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, did you come out against a thief? Did you come with swords and sticks? and spears to take me I sat daily with you in the temple you didn't lay a hand on me but all this was done Jesus said you could have arrested me anytime I was in the temple every day teaching but why are you only arresting me here and now why that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled it was all for a reason it goes right to the final closing scenes of Matthew's gospel then it was fulfilled, which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, they took 30 pieces of silver, the betrayal money that Judas Iscariot used, that he took in exchange for betraying Jesus. The very amount had been prophesied in Scripture in the book of Jeremiah, the price of him that was valued. It even prophesies here in verse 10, that he gave that money for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. Not only the amount of money that Judas took, but what he did with it, what happened to that money, when he cast it on the floor of the temple, they took it and they bought a field of blood. They bought a potter's field. And finally, we go to the last scene of Jesus' life in Matthew 27. The Bible says they crucified him and they parted his garments, casting lots. They're sitting at the foot of the cross and Jesus is dying in agony and the soldiers are casting lots for his garments. But that was fulfilled that was a prophecy that had been spoken. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. So all the way through the New Testament, we start to see this in the Gospels. This happened, that the cup might be filled up. This happened, that prophecy might be fulfilled. This happened, so, so that, that this could all come together like landing lights on a runway. And Jesus was aware of this as well. We read at the beginning of his ministry in Luke, he's just come back from being tempted in the wilderness and he stands up in the synagogue and he takes the scroll and he begins to read and he starts to say, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and he goes through all of that and he closes the book and he gives it to the minister and he sits down. Everybody in the synagogue that day is looking at Jesus of Nazareth and he just looks at them and says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. It was always there in the Bible. It was always there in the prophets. But it was like an empty cup just waiting and longing to be filled up. But this day, the cup got filled up. And we see it not only at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, but we see it at the very end of his ministry. When he appears to his disciples and he says to them, These are the words which I spake unto you when I was still with you, that all things, here it is, must be fulfilled. Jesus said, guys, the reason all this happened, the reason we went through everything we went through, the reason you saw me uh, beaten and bloodied, whipped and bruised, the reason you saw the crown of thorns and the spear and the nails and the crucifixion, the reason that all happened is it had to happen, that all these things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Jesus said the whole Old Testament was a portrait, it was pointing toward me. The whole Old Testament was basically an empty cup of prophecy just waiting for Jesus to come, just waiting for the very first Christmas, just waiting for Messiah to appear and fill up that cup of prophecy. And he did it, fill it up. He filled it to overflowing. He said unto them, thus it is written, thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And then he says, and guys, here's, here's why we went through all of this. Here's why I did this. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And Jesus told them, and you are witnesses of these things. And if you'll go and if you'll preach repentance and if you'll preach remission of sins, baptism, if you'll do that, then I'm going to send the promise of my Father upon you so now you can go and tarry in the city of Jerusalem and you'll be endued with power from on high. It was all for a reason. That Old Testament was simply an empty cup just waiting for Jesus to come. Jesus came to fulfill every one of those 
ancient prophecies. Come on back, Kathy, if you would. He came, first Christmas, not just to be a baby in a manger so we would have some nice, comforting Christmas hymns to sing. He came not just so we would have some kind of religious story to tell our children. He came to fulfill all the ancient prophecies. Jesus came to fill up this eternal cup that he himself had set in place before the world began. The cup was there all the time, but it was empty. The cup was there all the time, but there was something not filled, something not complete. The cup was always there. But when Jesus came to earth, when God of eternity entered time, the cup started to fill up. The prophets spoke about Bethlehem. The prophets spoke about the virgin birth. The prophets spoke about him being called a Nazarene. The prophets spoke about all that. But as Jesus grew, the level of prophecy in that cup kept filling. They began to talk about his ministry and his parables. They began to talk about all of that. They, they wrote and they spoke hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born. They had no way of knowing. And then they prophesy his brutal trial and his torture and his death. It's amazing, really. God of eternity came to time so that those of us who could only ever live in time and end in time, so someday we could be with him forever in eternity. It's the ultimate trade. But it's even more than Jesus coming and filling up the cup of prophecy from the Old Testament. Because in the New Testament, this, this word that means to fill, this word that means to, to pour into, this word that means to take away emptiness, it's not just used about Old Testament prophecies. And they're amazing. There's, there's all kind, dozens and dozens of prophecies that all converge on the life of Jesus, that all converge on his birth, that all converge on the last weekend of his life when he dies at Calvary. All these prophecies converge. It's amazing. But it's more than that. Because the New Testament uses this word about something else. We read it here in Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. That's the same word. When God wanted to do something to start his church, to take his eternal spirit and put it in temporal vessels of flesh, the same word is used. And, and basically it, it's a picture. Plurao is the Greek. Filling, fulfilled. That word that described Jesus fulfilling all those ancient prophecies, it's the exact same word that scripture uses to describe Jesus filling your life. To describe Jesus coming in and taking away the emptiness of your heart. Do you understand this? That means that your life is just like one of those Old Testament prophecies. You came into existence just like the prophecies did by God's ordinance, by His design. But just like those prophecies, although God gave them, and although there's something special about them, they were always unfulfilled. And they were always empty. They were always missing something until Jesus came. And then all of a sudden, the gospel writers start to use this word. He did this that it might be fulfilled. He said this that it might be fulfilled. This happened that it might be fulfilled. And we see this growing picture in the gospels of Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, who didn't come to earth for himself. He would have been better off to stay in heaven. He came to earth for us. When we couldn't reach him, he decided to reach us. When we couldn't ever have a hope of touching him, he decided he was going to touch us. When we couldn't go to him, he came to us. It's amazing. And so you're just like one of those prophecies. This is what scripture tells us. That your life is like one of those unfulfilled prophecies. It's, it might be good. It might be wonderful in many ways. But it's just a shadow of what it was created to become until the day that you find him. It's just a shadow of what it could be until the day that Jesus comes in. 
when he entered into the realm of prophecy, that cup overflowed. And when Jesus enters into a human heart, the cup of a human heart overflows as well. You see, every life was created by God to find its filling, its fulfilling. That's why we have such ambition as human beings. We, we strive and we work and, and we're creative and we do many things. And we're always trying to find this fulfilling. And for a while, some, some of us find it in careers. Some of us find it in our ambitions. Some of us find it in education. Some of us find it in many different ways. Because you were born with that. Like an unfulfilled prophecy, God put you on this planet with this empty spot in you. And you can drown it out for a while, but you can't ever fill it without Jesus. Only in Jesus can this filling be found. Your life is like a prophecy in waiting. Your life is like a prophecy of Jesus. It's just like those Old Testament prophecies. That's why the scripture uses the same word. Prophecies were given and laid dormant for years until Jesus came. The same word is used of human beings, that a human being can be born and they can grow and they can get educated and they can get married and they can have a family. They can have a great career and a beautiful home. They can have everything, but they're like one of those prophecies that there's always something missing until Jesus steps in the middle of that life and fills it. That's the message of Christmas. Your life is like a prophecy a prophecy of Jesus. It's unique from every other life. It's a promise waiting for fulfillment. It's one that can only be fulfilled by God's coming. Not just to Bethlehem, that's just the beginning. It can only be fulfilled by God coming into your life. Jesus is your plurao. He's your fulfillment. He's the real purpose behind everything we are and everything we do. And if you invite Him to. See, see Christmas... God came to our world so we would know that he wanted us in his world. And if you invite him in, he'll fill everything. If you invite him in, it won't be empty anymore. If you invite him in, all the good things that you have in your life will be magnified and be even greater. Well, last scripture tonight. Colossians, Paul writes, and he says in chapter 2, For in him, in Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The fullness, the filling, it's the same word. In Jesus, everything that is God, everything that you can imagine about God, it's all in him. It fills him. The fullness of God is in Jesus. And then in the next verse, he says, But it's not just about Jesus who came who filled up prophecy and was filled up with the nature of God. It's also about you. And you are complete in Him. And that's the same word. It's complete in the English Bible, but it, it's the same word in the Greek language. You are fulfilled. The same way that Jesus had the fullness of God in His body when He was born in Bethlehem. When you know Jesus, you are made complete in Him. You are filled by Him. You are fulfilled by Him which is the head of all principality and power. The commercial we played tonight, the wonderful German supermarket. The best gift is time spent with you. Jesus gave us the best gift that could ever be given to us at Christmas because he decided that he wasn't content to stay in the realm of eternity forever and forever without us. He came to spend time here. He came to give us himself. He came so that we could know him and know what God is like. The best gift you can give Jesus in return is yourself. The best gift you can give your family, your marriage, your kids is Jesus because it's not that you're doing bad. It's just that when he comes in, he pulls you back to your purpose. He pulls you back to your center. He pulls you back to what you were created for. It's amazing. He came to me. Church, I'd like you, if you would, just to take a moment and pray with Pastor right now at the end of this service. If you're visiting with us tonight, first of all, thank you for being here. We are honored by your presence. We exist 
not so there can be another building with a steeple or a cross on it. We exist so that people's lives can be changed. And you're seated among some of the finest people I know. Not because they're the wealthiest in the city or they're the most popular or they're the best at any certain thing. You're seated among some of the finest people I know because Jesus Christ entered their life and turned it around. When we couldn't get to him, he came to us. That, my friends, is the message of Christmas. Would you try this with me one more time? He came to me. He came to me. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. That's why he died on Calvary. When I could not come. That's why he died on Calvary. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. pray with pastor Lord Jesus I thank you for the message of Christmas I thank you for the hope of the manger and the cross and the empty tomb I thank you God that when we had no hope of getting to eternity you took it upon yourself you robed yourself in flesh and you came into time we couldn't get to where you were so you came to where we were but it's more than Bethlehem there are people here tonight that there's all kinds of issues and problems and things they're dealing with and sometimes they feel like I could never get there, I could never be that, I could never do that. But God, when we can't get to you today, when we can't get to you from where we are in our lives right now, you're still the God who leaves eternity and comes into time and touches us. God, I pray that somebody's Christmas would be especially blessed, not because they receive some incredible gift, not because they go to some incredible event, but I pray that somebody's Christmas would be especially blessed this year because for the very first time, they open up their heart and they allow you to touch them. They open up their heart and they expose the emptiness, not to everybody else, but just to you. And they give you a chance. I pray that somebody in this beautiful service tonight would leave here and have the best Christmas that they could ever have. You came on the first Christmas, so we'd know you were willing. And you come every day into lives when they are willing. Jesus, I can't get to where you are, but you can get to where I am. And so I pray for somebody here tonight that you would minister to their heart, touch them this Christmas. May they have the greatest Christmas ever because they give you a chance in their life. It's not a religion, Jesus. It's a relationship, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said amen. Amen. If you would stand with me right now, thank you again for joining us tonight. We're so grateful for everybody that's here. And I know many of you are here in town visiting family. And we welcome you. If you're not from Fredericton, we're so glad you're in our city. 
and we're totally honored by the fact that you would take time tonight to join us. I'd like to close by just singing that old Christmas carol that says, Oh, come let us adore him, and then we're going to head our separate ways. Have a wonderful Christmas and an incredible new year. Oh, come let us adore